The world-renowned political economist Samir Amin passed away on the 12th of August at age 86. He left behind a radical legacy that profoundly influenced the globe. Amin was a tireless advocate for third world liberation, who transformed the way we understand capitalism and imperialism. He dedicated his life to not only understanding what imperialism is, but also exploring how to fight it. Samir Amin emphasized that imperialism in the 21st century is different from imperialism in the 20th. Since the collapse of the socialist Eastern Bloc, the world today is a global dictatorship of monopoly capital dominated by U.S. finance. The planet is controlled by a small handful of capitalist oligarchs who have unimaginable power. Capitalism has become the dictatorship of oligarchies. Dictatorship of oligarchies in the United States, in Europe, in Japan. The demonstration in New York with the 99% is correct. 1% is controlling everything in the U.S., and even less than 1% in a number of people. Now, <clears throat> second, that means that it's the end of democracy. Democracy has become a farce. Electoral democracy leads nowhere, because uh, if any majority would be against the dictatorship of the oligarchy, they are annihilated immediately and compelled to adjust. Samir Amin also explained how, since the end of what is commonly referred to as the Cold War, which was really a U.S.-led capitalist war on socialism throughout the globe, that war continued even after the collapse of the Soviet Union, right up until today, destroying any country that tries to pursue a path independent from the U.S.-dominated financial oligarchy. And this is what the Cold War continues. Now, the Cold War was not uh, an invention of Stalin after the Second World War. The Cold War was continuous after the Hot War, the intervention, 1917 to 1920 or 22. The Cold War continued from 22 to, uh, the, uh, to 1990 or 91 and continued after, and continued after, which means that this system has reached a point when, where it cannot tolerate any country, big or small, to try to be independent, not to accept the total dictatorship of the oligarchies, even through a local oligarchy. Amin stressed that international imperialist institutions like NATO and the World Bank help maintain this capitalist dictatorship. So leaving and dismantling these institutions is crucial in the struggle for economic and political independence and self-determination. You have to fight and move out of NATO. It's very central to the policies of uh, maintaining this ol financial oligarchy in power in the West. Many of you have been brainwashed by the U.S. propaganda, by U.S. universities, saying that there is no alternative but capitalism and globalization. Samir Amin, whose parents were Egyptian and French, and who spent much of his life in Egypt, was deeply involved in the national liberation and decolonization movements of the Global South in the 1960s and 70s. He also developed the well-known concept of Eurocentrism, but as a Marxist, Amin always maintained that Eurocentrism is not just a cultural problem, but an economic and political one. The Real News spoke with political economist Ali Kadri, who was a friend of Samir Amin and who reflected on his legacy. I think his importance is, as a, as a particular in, in, in individual on, on the left is in the fact that he was anti-Eurocentric. He demystified a lot of the Eurocentrism that has for a long time, uh, blinded, uh, special, you know, Eurocentrism doesn't necessarily mean the geographic, you know, uh, Euro, Europe in the geographic sense, all those with the culture of Europe that extends across the globe, that see the world only in terms of development in European culture and European 
modes uh, of production in European property relations. And these things, it's, it's what imparted this progress that we've seen so far upon Earth, which is not much progress, as we all know. He was able to demystify to, from an internationalist perspective how the struggle uh, uh, emerged as an, how capitalism emerged as, 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 a, as a holistic condition relating uh, to the globe and how uh, uh, resistance to imperialism must take shape as a holistic condition uh, through internationalist action. And, uh, and, and because production is a global process, a social process as well. It's a social process that involves the laying, the, the laying of, the, of the social foundations production. There is unequal, uh, unequal conditions arise, of course. We, uh, we know how the system works. There's going to be raw material and labor and primary goods exported to the center, and then the system reverts and gives us the, this back in manufactured goods, where there is, uh, he, the system appropriates much value for little price and sells it at higher price and we have profits. And, and this accentuates the uh, uh, unequal development and unequal uh, between within the country, within countries themselves and across countries, but within a structure that actually shortchanges the South. Samir Amin saw the global South as the locus for global revolutionary transformation. For decades, he directed the Third World Forum in Senegal. Amin was a leading intellectual in what was called the Non-Aligned Movement, the attempt to form a political unity in the Global South in a common struggle against imperialism. Amin pointed out that the Cold War was not just a conflict between the U.S.-led capitalist West and the Soviet Union-led socialist Eastern Bloc. This perspective erases the Global South, which formed its own movement in the Afro-Asian Conference of 1955, known as the Bandung Conference. For his entire life, Amin saw Bandung as a model that should continue in the future. The U.S. propaganda today says that this history has to be read as the history of the Cold War. That is, two actors, U.S. and Soviet Union, and all the others are allies or lackeys of one or the two. This is the concept of the Cold War. It is a lie. The countries of the South were not non-aligned, meaning not aligned on the US and on Soviet Union. They were non-aligned on globalization of that time. And this is why they could invent a few years later the word self-reliance. I used a year, some year even before, delinking, deconnection. It is the material circumstance that shape consciousness, and material circumstance is not necessarily the uh, objectification of the technological condition within the productive forces. It's not because there is better machines. The productive forces also involves is a social category that involves forms of, forms of social organization. The conditions for revolution in the, some southern states, uh, where there is the, this uh, over, overlap between uh, the social aspects of the productive forces and the, and the acute inequality and the acute repression that follows acute inequality, where we see that there's a possibility for, for a brighter future. And here, of course, for this to be successful, uh, the Samir, of course, talks about economies of self-reliance. The Bandung it was a very important step in, in those uh, in, 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 in for him as a project. And the revival of Bandung has always been, uh, he's always talked about that. To explore ways for countries in the global south to try to forge an independent path, Samir Amin developed the concept of de-linking. Pro-capitalist critics have portrayed delinking simply as a glorified form of isolationism and autarky, but Amin stressed that it is in fact the opposite. Delinking does not mean that. Delinking means something else. It's a strategy that you try to submit your external relations, which means that you have external relations, 
political, economic, trade and law to the priority of your own internal development. It's a, 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 a strategy of submitting external relations to your own needs to the extent that it is possible. Nothing is possible 100%. Of course, the margin for a huge country and with a glorious history as China, the margin is wider than it is for a poor country of, uh, five, of less than one million inhabitants here or there in Africa. But there is always a margin, small or, or wider. Now, it is exactly the opposite, delinking is exactly the opposite of what is suggested to us, which is structural adjustment. Structural adjustment is that you, the weak, adjust to the need of the strong. That is, you accept submission. Structural adjustment is Congo should adjust to the needs of the U.S. Why the U.S. should not adjust to the needs of Congo? The opposite. So the opposite is the linking. Is that we try to, and we succeed never 100%, we succeed more or less to compel the other, the stronger, to adjust to you. Then we've come to delinking because under globalization we had to have a new uh, globalization was as hitching everybody was hooking everybody to the bandwagon bandwagon of the FIIs and and the fact that financialization has, which was already there has taken new forms has become much more uh, uh, significant in in, in 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 the uh, reproduction of of capital and that is where. Uh, Samir, I mean, you know, and his ingenuity come in is in the fact that he's capable of developing concepts to marry uh, to, or to correspond the changes in the times, and that's his genius, uh, and uh, and that's why where 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 he stood. But this, of course, doesn't negate the fact that we need to articulate all the forces that are ready for the struggle. And that's where internationalism comes in. This is not a geographic, you know, uh, view of the world that necessarily, that when we say Eurocentric, we mean the Europeans or whiteness or anything of this nature. It has, this is beyond that. This is the abstract capital, the, uh, which is the real force to which kowtows, you know, to which everything is, is uh, has to kowtow or follows as, uh, submissively. Samir Amin was a revolutionary optimist who saw the conditions for revolutionary transformation everywhere. At the same time, however, he warned that the capitalist erosion of democracy under the present oligarchical imperialist system is fueling the resurgence of fascism. In a period where the uh, decline of democracy, instead of being a uh, um, associated with politicization and understanding that the people need a higher stage of democracy, we move back to fascism, to, not, to fascism or neo-fascism, call it as you want, in the north and in the south. In the north, it takes the form that you are, can see everywhere, in France, in Germany, in uh, everywhere. Uh, and in the south, in the format of pseudo passeist uh, mythology, whether Islamic for a number of countries, which are Muslim countries, or Hinduist. I mean, it's, it's quasi fascist what has happened in India with the Modi regime following uh, the uh, Congress party regimes. Now, so. We are in a period, such a period, is a period, as Lenin understood for the first long crisis, a revolutionary, potential, potentially revolutionary. But will this uh, opportunity be taken or not 
it's not obvious until today that it will be taken. Samir Amin was much more than a theorist. He was a lifelong activist and revolutionary. For him, these economic and political concepts were not mere academic ideas. They were tools to try to change the world. And Amin spent decades writing dozens of books that bequeath these tools of transformation to future generations. While the political economist has passed, his radical legacy will live on and on. He's truly a, 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 a man of, of, of a resistor, a man who resists imperialism, a man who deeply b- believes that, that the path to an alternative world is, is, is quite optimistic, uh, you know, as, as, as every person is. But he's at the same time, he's not in the struggle simply to win. He's in the struggle knowing that there could be losses. He's in the struggle because he is convinced that this is in the dignity of human lives, in the dignity of humanity and all all of humanity. And not with a view to making making a front which expands across diverse nature of social forces, Uh, not necessarily Marxist in the proper sense, not necessarily orthodox Marxist. But all the social groups, all the peasant groups, all the uh, fran- disenfranchised identity groups, and, and so forth, in a common front, in an internationalist front, to spearhead the struggle against imperialism. So he was a relentless anti- anti-imperialist. He was a, uh, and he, he he's lived it uh, in his personal life, and and he's lived it in his intellectual life, and he delivered on it. Reporting for The Real News, I'm Ben Norton.